Hey folks, welcome back to NC State Dendrology. So we're continuing our journey west and looking at forests of North America. And we're, this is our second lecture for the Rocky Mountains. And we're focusing on the higher elevation systems and also those that are farther to the north in this lecture. So um, soon you'll be departing for Thanksgiving and you'll be able to go home and impress your family and friends with your knowledge of dendrology. So kudos to you and hang in there. So um, quick trivia question, what park experienced catastrophic wildfires in 1988? Okay, so that was Yellowstone National Park. It was really startling to visit there um, quite a few years later because it's so far north in Wyoming. Um, the growing season is short, trees grow very slowly there. So recovery is also very slow. Um, and I have an article linked here um, that talks about fire recovery after 1988. Um, so today we, the first Rocky Mountain lecture, we focused on these light gray areas. So this is the pinion pine juniper woodland. And then we talked um, more about the ponderosa pine, which is, has a pretty broad extent um, throughout the West actually. Um, and talking about those stands, this is actually on a plateau. So um, a little bit higher elevation, still very dry forest. So you also see them kind of at the edge of the prairie. Here, are those forests here in wetter areas, and then um, dry areas on the backside of the Cascades and the Sierras. So, ponderosa pine is pretty widely distributed. And then today, we're going to focus on um, lodgepole pine, which is shown in the red um, forest types. And then we've got montane, um, oops, the montane forests, and so or. Um, that have, um, we have, I think the spruce fir is shown in dark pink and the, my cheat sheet somewhere around here. Um, and then the light pink is the sub, subalpine is spruce fir at the highest elevation. Um, and then the light pink is a different forest type and I've cut the, um, I've cut the key off here. So I don't have that on me right now. We'll come back to that later. So, First of all, I just want to give a quick overview. If you're not that familiar with Rocky Mountains and the geography there, it consists of several mountain ranges, right? The Rockies extend from British Columbia and Alberta all the way um, down into Mexico. We talked about that in the first lecture. And so you've got um, the Cascades up here in the Pacific Northwest. We'll talk about those next week, as well as the Sierra Nevada, which is down here in the eastern part of California. And then um, we've got the Great Basin, right? So that's in a rain shadow. So that's this area of Northern Nevada, um, which also is kind of at the edge of the Great Salt Lake Desert. This is also in the rain shadow of the Sierras. And then um, the Columbia Basin similarly is a um, basin that's drier in the rain shadow from the Cascades and Olympics and Coast Range. And then um, a commercially important valuable area for forestry is the, what's called the Inland Empire. And so that's this area of, Ohio, of Idaho, um, Montana and Wyoming is considered the Inland Empire. So we've already looked at this chart before looking at principal forest types and acknowledging that we're doing a very broad brush approach to understanding these forest types. They can be really hard to sort out in more detail if you aren't familiar with the forest. And so we're gonna stick with um, broad categories. Um, first, we'll talk about, we talked about the, um, these types already, right, a transition from basically non-forest to woodland um, at the lower elevations, the driest areas where there's not enough rainfall for trees. And then that woodland, um, which is the pinion pine juniper um, forest type with widely spaced trees, rainfall 15 to 18 inches right in that woodland zone that we would expect with scattered trees, but not closed canopies. And then ponderosa pine, which is um, submontane, and um, that's when you get a little bit higher rainfall, it's still on the low end of the spectrum though. So these are generally speaking 6,000 to 7,000 feet and the forest starts out in the drier areas with widely spaced trees and becomes more dense over time. Then we'll talk today, we're gonna to talk about the montane forest system. And there's a couple of types that we'll talk about within montane system. And then finally subalpine, which is spruce fir. So I'm, um, in the last slide, I couldn't remember which which pink was which for the montane and subalpine, but we'll revisit that um, towards the end of the lecture. So 
not to fear, we'll get there. So I'm gonna start with this sort of transition slide because I think it's a, a great overview and a good visual. Um, and so this is taken at Rocky Mountain National Park, which is in the Northwest corner of Colorado. And you can see this bright orange tree, right? That's definitely ponderosa pine. And you can see this is a ponderosa pine forest down here with scattered trees. This one's gone through some restoration. We're actually transitioning into the montane system. You can see examples of this montane system with a closed canopy um, later, and then also an ecotone here with maybe a different forest type and then kind of open rock above the tree line. So again, that's Rocky Mountain National Park. And um, when we're talking about the Rocky Mountains, they're key environmental factors that sort of drive what forest you can expect to find. Um, and so rainfall is a big one, elevation is a big one. Of course, talking about elevation being a substitute for temperature and precipitation. The aspect can be very important depending on which side of the Rockies you're on, if you're on the dry rain shadow side or the wet area that's getting most of that rainfall. And then um, topography can make a difference um, on a more local level. And then finally, fire history is really, really important in this region, and we'll talk about that quite a bit more. Um, at the lower elevations, the systems we already talked about, water is the, by far the most limiting factor. And so that's why you see, especially on the eastern side of the Rockies, a lot, lot the, that, the eastern side of the Rockies and then also the rain shadows in the basins, Great Basin and Columbia Basin, is where you see that pinyon pine juniper forest um, transitioning into woodland like ponderosa pine and ponderosa pine forest. At higher elevations, there are other factors involved. And so we're gonna spend some time talking about those. So again, this is Rocky Mountain National Park. You can see this stand is something early successional, maybe Aspen, a little bit hard to tell here. And then you can see these scattered um, open canopy forest of ponderosa pine morphing into a denser mixed forest stand. And then you can see some of the subalpine forest with um, very pointy canopies of spruce and fir and then transitioning above tree line. Um, so here's my gratuitous animal photo of, uh, I think it's a golden squirrel, not quite sure of his name. Um, so this montane zone is where we're gonna start. It varies a lot more with latitude and geography than the other low of elevation forests that we've looked at already. Um, they also are the most biologically diverse. So why do you think that might be? So one reason is that there is a lot of um, variance in the environmental conditions. So there's a lot of variance in rainfall, also difference in disturbance. This is a very widespread um, zone in throughout the Rockies. And so you're just gonna see, you know, a lot of diversity in terms of your environmental conditions, which then results in biological diversity as well. So you have different species adapted to different conditions. So just an overview of this montane zone, generally speaking, depends on latitude, found between 7,000 and 9,000 feet. Annual rainfall is over 18 inches, but you know, definitely more than the ponderosa pine forest. And as I said, the species composition varies depending on geography. So we'll look at a few examples. And the structure of those forests ranges from open to closed canopy, some of these forests are fire adapted. And this photo is um, Douglas fir, Pseudosuga menziesii um, in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. This is a species that we will learn in lab. And Douglas fir is a key species in the montane zone for two out of the three types. So it's easy to identify because it has these little bracts that actually extend beyond the cone scales. Um, one of my friends told me a trick says that he pictures these as looking like a little mouse diving into the cone scales with two little feet and a tail. So the principal species is Douglas fir, Pseudosuga menziesii, which you can see has a really extensive range throughout the West, also an incredibly valuable um, commercial species. There are two different varieties that are recognized. In the Rocky Mountains, we have um, Pseudosuga menziesii var glauca. And in the Pacific Northwest, we have Pseudosuga menziesii var menziesii. So that's up here. And so it forms closed stands in some places, but it also grows in stands that are mixed with other species. The drier sites, right? So in looking at the montane zone, right? Thinking about the Rocky Mountains, the drier sites are going to be towards the south 
right? And also towards the west. And so um, these stands include Douglas fir as a main component, also quaking aspen, Populus tremuloides, which we learn in lab, and also ponderosa pine, right? Which we know can tolerate some of the driest conditions that still result in trees, Pinus ponderosa. And um, just a little bit about quaking aspen, which we do learn in lab, this is considered to be the most widely distributed tree in North America. There's always a designation that I, I wonder if that's really true, but maybe I'm just showing my southeastern bias here because it doesn't grow anywhere near the southeast. Um, one of the neat things you can do, it, this is a big component. I've been up to the Coco Nino National Forest, which is in northern Arizona, and rode a ski lift for my birthday up to the top. Um, my birthday is in September, so during the non-ski season, you can get a lift ride to the top. And one of the things I know we talked about um, quaking aspen growing in these clones. And so when the leaves change color, the whole clone will change at exactly the same time and also exactly the same shade of yellow. And so if you look carefully, you can see a few different shades of yellow. So there's one that's a little bit more orange or golden that's back here. And so that designates the entire clone, right? If it's the right color um, or if all the trees are the same color that designates a single clone. And so that really drives home the massiveness of, um, you know, Pando and these big clones and colonies of quaking aspen. To the north, we have more moisture versions of this montane zone forest. And so in addition to Douglas fir, which is a main component species, we have Western hemlock, Suga heterophylla, which you learned in lab. Um, you can see that it is um, constrained to, you know, in the, in the Rockies, just Idaho and Montana. And then we have Western red cedar, Puya plicata, not a species we learn in lab, although we do learn of Puya. So um, when you see its picture, you'll, you'll recognize it as being something familiar. So Puya plicata, and then finally grand fir, Abies grandis. Let's talk about these just a little bit more. So it's really fascinating. I got a chance to travel to the Inland Empire which if you recall is this area of Idaho, Montana and Wyoming um, to learn about forestry there and managing these stands silviculturally and mixed stands is just really fascinating. There's definitely a lot of art going on as well as science. And so these mixed stands have, um, right, this is the Inland Empire, which is a little bit moister. It has a mixed stand of Pseudosuga manzesia and you can see the enormous tree here. Grand fir, which I hope you look at and think, oh yeah, that looks like a fir with its flat needles, um, a little bit longer than, than the fir that we know. And then finally, Western red cedar, um, Thuya plicata, right, which has these flat sprays, very much like the Northern white cedar that we learned in lab. And then finally, the third type of forest we have within this montane zone are fire-driven sites. So this is primarily dominated, instead of Douglas fir, we have lodgepole pine, Pinus concorda, and I put in this map that includes the range in Canada so that you can see the true range of Pinus contorta. Um, in the Rockies, Pinus contorta has ceratinous cones. This is a species we'll learn in lab. And here's the picture of the cones um, still attached to the tree. They are open in this case. And then in addition to the lodgepole pine, we have Western white pine, Pinus meticula, Western larch, which is Larix occidentalis, and quaking aspen maybe surprises you, Populus tremuloides. Um, quaking aspen, I just mentioned, you know, it's very extensive. It's also a very thin bark species, and so it's not resistant to fire, but it's often an early successional species following fire. So the fire in these areas has a longer interval than, than the fire interval in the southeast. So they think 100 to 300 years. And the type of fire that we're talking about here, for logical pine, is a stand replacing catastrophic fire. So um, looking at this photo of a lodgepole pine crown fire, you can see it retains branches all the way down to the ground. So this acts as a fire ladder, pulling the fire up into the canopy. And so while these fires may be, these catastrophic fires may look really startling, that's part of the natural fire, fire cycle for this species. We do have evidence um, that this cycle is changing and changing rapidly. And we'll talk about that more next week. Um, but at least for now, you know, these catastrophic fires are not out of the realm of reason in terms of a natural occurrence. This photo is really famous. This was taken during the 1988 Yellowstone fires and you can see 
um, either these, I'm guessing, elk or maybe mule deer are here in the Yellowstone River um, in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And they're surrounded by this just flaming, crazy flaming landscape that Yellowstone National Park shows 1988 fires up so all logical pine. Um, and so this looks really like a horrendous disaster, um, but in, in actuality, fire is always patchy, even catastrophic wildfire. So you can see this from this aerial photo that there are large stands of trees that were absolutely torched. Um, but there's some little strips in here of trees that are brown, right? So the trees didn't actually go up in flames, but so much of the root system burned that these trees are dying. And you can see that kind of buffer at the edge, but there are still um, pieces of intact forest. And so that leads to kind of a mosaic and um, an uneven aged forest stand. So these stands look, you know, pretty bad early on. And because the growing season is sh so short and the trees grow slowly, um, these tend to retain fire scores for long periods of time. In the southeastern United States, you know, it's only a couple of years after a fire that you really have to know what to look for in order to see the past evidence of fire. Um, in Yellowstone, right, there's a big response by wildflowers. So these beautiful wildflowers grow because sunlight is now reaching the forest floor following the fire and nutrients are released. This photo I found really surprising. I forgot to check to see what year it was taken, but it's not as young as you think it is. Um, it's actually quite a few years after those 1988 fires. If you look in the notes section on the slides, you, you can see the year I just write it in there. I just don't remember what it was. But here's this packed stand of baby lodgepole pines, which require that catastrophic fire to open up their cones, disperse the seeds into a mineral seabed, and get started. Um, and so just to recap that, right, so this montane zone, we have three distinct types of forest within the montane zone. And of course, we could subdivide these into many more categories, right? If we needed to know much more specific information, there's definitely you know, loads of forest types within that. Um, but generally speaking, Douglas fir is the wide, most widespread species. There's lots of variation by its geography. And then we have three different types within the montane zone. We have drier sites, moisture sites and fire adapted sites. So the drier sites are generally found in the south and west. Um, they have quaking aspen. Um, the moisture sites um, ended up adding western hemlock and western red cedar, which are species that are more commonly found in the Pacific Northwest. And then the fire adapted species, right? So through Yellowstone and um, maybe more of that eastern edge of the northern Rockies, we have lodgepole pine as the dominant species, um, which is specially adapted to periodic stand replacing fire. I just wanted to show this picture of Western larch, which has just a really lovely growth form. This is in one of these mixed stands in um, the Inland Empire and how it has these very graceful long branches. Remember, this is one of our, our only gymnast firm that has deciduous, no, not our only gymnast firm, our only um, member of the Pinaceae that has deciduous. Foliage. So this foliage will turn yellow and drop off. So moving upward in this case, so this is still taken at Rocky Mountain National Park in northwestern Colorado. And this is on a hike I did with my family. You can see that we're now going into completely pointy coniferous forest. And then you're starting to see these areas above that don't have trees for whatever reason. In this case, a lot of this is just steep slopes and not enough soil. Um, but we're definitely getting into that subalpine zone. So subalpine zone, generally speaking, occurs between 9,000 and 11,000 feet. Again, they're, it's not super water limited. It gets about 18 inches of rainfall annually. And this is, this is I try to place this in my mind, this is the highest forest zone that is below the tree line. And so if you can associate it with the spruce fir forest that we have in the east, you'll remember that this is the one that's at the highest end of the spectrum. Of course, in the southeast, our spruce fir forest occurs between 5,000 and 6,500 feet. So it's kind of funny to think about um, being, you know, so much taller now um, in the Rocky Mountains. So overall, the rainfall is a lot less than the east. So that's an important key difference between these spruce fir forest types. The soil is thin and rocky. That's no surprise. And then species that live there have to be adapted for high winds. Very cool and very short summers and cold winters. 
Um, and then there's a new disturbance type that we haven't talked about so far, um, which is avalanches. So avalanches are a significant source of disturbance um, at these very high elevations with lots of snowpack in the winter. You'll also notice that these forest canopies have extremely narrow pointed crowns to help shed snow and ice. So these all have an evergreen canopy, um, little to no understory, there's just not a whole lot of soil that's there. And then as you get towards climatic tree line, the trees get more stunted and um, misshapen by the winds and the winter storms. Principal species here, so here in the Rockies, the principal spruce fir forest species are Engelmann spruce, which is Picea engelmannii, and some alpine fir, which is Aves laziocarpa. So you can see here, right, this Engelmann spruce has opened, it's got a lot of cones. Um, it might surprise you for me to say that this is an Engelmann spruce because it's pointed up on the branch like a fir. But notice in this photo that they're not all pointing up. And in fact, if you look at subalpine fir, they always, the cones always perch on the tops of the branches. So that's one way to, keep, to tell spruce and fir apart if you can get up close. Um, so looking at Engelmann spruce, it is widespread throughout the West um, and on up into Canada. It comprises, um, it's got this long straight crown and then the fir species is subalpine fir, very similar overlapping range. And then I liked this poster because so many of the trees we talk about in this lecture and the last lecture are featured here. So everything from the shortest stature lodgepole pine, which is, you know, very drought tolerant, very fire adapted on the east coast side of the spectrum. And then the largest trees are um, ponderosa pine over here on the far left. It's very distinctive orangey bark. Um, and I didn't talk a lot about Western white pine, but that's also a very commercially valuable species. Um, so yeah, you have Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir kind of here at the top. So um, some of the other species we talked about, grand fir, Douglas fir, right, being important to two of the areas in the montane zone. Western hemlock, et cetera. You can um, also link to this article for how they did that. And, um, you know, this forest type, right, is down here along the lake, but very quickly we get to where there's no trees. And so this is a hike, of, we hiked past Sky Pond and we were headed up to Andrews Glacier. This is very deceiving. It looks like it's um, not very steep, but it is super steep and icy. And we were post holing in June. Um, because the snow is melting. So definitely in the um, non-forested zone. And that's, I guess, what I really want to show you in these last slides is that we have this non-vegetated, or not non-vegetated, non-forest type that's at our very highest elevation. So what does it actually look like above the tree line? Well, first of all, you get this extensive snowpack. And then there is quite a lot of vegetation. And if you look closely, you're in for a real treat because there are some amazing little alpine wildflowers that grow at these highest elevations. This is the Ute Trail that's on that road that goes up to the highest elevations of Rocky Mountain National Park. And um, so here we're above 11,500 feet. We think that climatic tree line, the Rockies is averages around 11,500 feet, extremely harsh climate here. So there's not a whole lot of soil. The soils that are there are thin and rocky. And then thinking about what weather's like throughout the year, you have very high winds blowing through these summits, um, very cool and short summers, extremely cold winters and deep snowpack. So a lot of the plants are completely under snow um, for a couple months out of the year. And so the plants that thrive there are alpine plants. So they need full sun, they can't tolerate shade, and you know they go away during those times um, where there's deep snow and they flower, you know, just during that short growing season, they don't need very much to flower. An important point here is that these alpine meadows are not the same thing as tundra. Primary reason is tundra includes permafrost. So these, these stands, these sites look quite a lot like the alpine tundra, but it's, we call it alpine and the alpine zone, but there's no permafrost here, so we can't call it tundra. Um, up at these very high elevations, there are sometimes tree species if they're kind of sheltered or protected from the weather. Um, and I have a link here that you can look those out. And you can see that a lot of these 
pines have a very sprawling form. So that includes um, Pinus aristata, right? So the bristlecone pine. Um, it includes limber pine, Pinus fluxilis, and also white bark pine, Pinus abacalis. And we have an example of limber pine shown here at Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so lastly, I just want to wrap with reviewing um, this Forest Service map and the forest types that are here. I think it's a useful thing to try and um, break down and organize, and that way it helps you kind of sort these communities out. I like maps and geography, so I think that's really, really helpful. Um, and so we have, right, this is just a wrap up of all of the Rocky Mountains. So we have our pinyon pine juniper forest here in light gray. You can see how extensive this is. I talked about ponderosa pine being in the dark gray earlier in lecture. And then we have um, in the southern part of the southern Rockies, we have the red, which is lodgepole pine, fire adapted species that comes in to Colorado and also Utah. Um, and then that's a much more extensive type, right? That's the primary tree and the primary forest type in Yellowstone National Park, which is located here. And then we have a light pink. So that is spruce fir um, shown, right? So that's that subalpine, right, at the highest elevations. And then the dark pink is the montane zones. This is Douglas fir. And remember, um, depending on where you are, right, you're going to get the more southern type, which is drier, the more the northern type, which is a little bit moister. And then you've also got the fire type. Um, that, you know, has um, some of the, um, well, no, I'm sorry, not the fire type. The fire type is lodgepole pine and that's in red. This is the montane zone, right, which includes um, the moist areas of Douglas fir. So Douglas fir extensively found all over the Northwest. Um, and that just shows you sort of a general delineation of some of the most important forest types that we're talking about in this lecture and the last one. Um, so just a quick wrap up here. So generally speaking, montane zone forests of the Rockies have a higher diversity and more variability. And that's because moisture is not limiting and the conditions are not terribly harsh. So it's not at that alpine zone. Um, Douglas fir, Pseudosuga menziesii is widespread in the most common species, but it's mixed with other species depending on whether conditions are dry and warm, in which case they go, those species go west and south. Moist if we're talking about the northern Rockies, or fire prone if we're talking about the eastern side that's fire prone. The subalpine zone, right, which is just above the montane zone, is a familiar type. It's spruce fir forest, definitely a lot drier than our southern Appalachian version. And then um, we see climatic tree line at about 11,500 feet. So this, of course, varies by latitude. So the farther north you go, the lower um, climatic tree line occurs. And some pines that we know are especially adapted to capture the high mountain flanks that are protected, so protected from the weather. And then the very highest elevations still have these really lovely alpine meadows that have teeny tiny plants um, to operate, to sort of occupy that and cover that ground. So that's what we have today for um, to wrap up the Rocky Mountains in NC State Dendrology. And thanks for stopping by. That's a wrap.